several sessions, and I shared quite a bit of stuff, so you may not be walking in the fullness of everything I shared with you because you're last. <laughs> so that is a lot of information, and when we realize sometimes our eyes are open and we realize how much we're missing something, that can be kind of overwhelming. And sometimes it's even a shock to us to realize, I thought I was someplace that I'm not. Mm -hmm. But the thing you need to understand, God wasn't surprised. <laughs> and then all of a sudden we find out we're surprised. And, oh my goodness, he's really upset with me now that I really messed up. But he knew you messed up before you did. <laughs> you know? So why all of a sudden is he upset with you when you find out you messed up? <laughs> so there are so many tactics that Satan uses to rob our inheritance and our relationship with God. And we're simply ignorant of his tactics. So the fruit that we see in the body of Christ all over the world, and you see it, and you understand some of it, but I've traveled all over the world, and I go to all different denominations, so I see it firsthand. So I'm not ignorant of the tactics that Satan is using, and the fact that the body of Christ is mostly ignorant of his tactics, that's the fruit that's there, but we're also ignorant of God's tactics, his ways of doing things. Because most of them are functioning from a spiritual realm, and I shared a little bit about 1 Corinthians 2 the last time, where it, it compares the natural and the spiritual, and it makes it very clear the natural can understand things in the natural realm, but it cannot understand things in the spiritual realm. And that's what's amazing, because everybody functions from that natural realm, generally. Mm -hmm. Occasionally, in desperation, we humble ourselves, we get in the spirit, and we get some revelation, and we get out of trouble or we get some help in something, but usually that is just fleeting moments, but then generally we're back functioning from that natural realm. So we don't really understand the things of the Spirit because that scripture is not saying that it's difficult to understand the things of the spiritual realm from the natural. It's saying it is impossible. Now, if God says something's impossible, guess what? It's impossible. He doesn't lie. Right. Yet we keep thinking, well, I'm smarter than I figure this out. I mean, Satan keeps working on our egos and our pride to think we were smart enough to do that. And, it, and the fruit shows we're not. We see all the divisions in the body of Christ, and Satan is the author behind that. And it's amazing after hundreds of years, some of them a thousand years going on ministries, that nobody figures out how he did it. <laughs> Everybody can clearly see the error in some of the other groups, but we can't see it in our own. <laughs> but they can. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? The devil will let you see the error he put in another church. You realize that? The devil will show that to you. But he won't show it to that church. <laughs> but that church, he will show the error he put in you. In your organization. Something that you have is true, but it's not the truth. Now, some of this obviously have completely unscriptural things. You realize that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the ones that if you ask the pastor why you believe that, they will give you clear scriptures on why they believe that. But they don't give you all the scriptures on the subject. So if you've ever studied the subject and you know all the pieces pertaining to it, then you know there's some pieces missing. Yeah, if you had a home a, a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle of a certain scene, and you put that puzzle together, you know what the whole picture is. So if someone comes along and they have a puzzle that they're going to work, and about 200 of the pieces are missing, and they go get 200 from another box and mix in with it, you know, they're going to have some things in that picture when they get finished that resembles what you had, 
but they won't have all the things to be some different. So it's like if everybody has part of those 500 or 1,000, but some of them don't, so they haven't materialized what they are, the whole picture comes up a little bit different, just enough that we aren't in agreement. And then Satan will give you the scripture. How can you walk together except they agree? It's amazing that he uses scriptures to divide us. Mm -hmm. He uses scriptures to get us to judge each other. The very work that he did and blame God for it. He tried, he tried to use God's word to justify his work. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing that we don't seem to figure that out. Most Christians know the scriptures say that if you knew how the thief was breaking in and stealing from you, you would set a watch and you wouldn't let him do that. And most people are not there. Of course you would. And if you realize every time you went home, there was something else you knew was yours was missing. And you found out there was a latch broken on one of your windows, and that's how the thief is getting in. How long are you going to leave that window? broken and just keep coming home and buying more and more things missing. I mean, would think that would be crazy. Yet, I can share with Christians all around the world exactly how Satan is stealing something worth a whole lot more than you got in your house. And we don't ever fix the problem. We just leave the same problem there and he keeps using that same method for generations. And he passes it down and every generation passes it Next, and nobody figures out how he's doing it. Now, I can understand that. What I can't understand is if somebody shows you how he's doing it, <laughs> and the Holy Spirit in you witness to you, that's how he's doing it, but you still won't fix the latch. When it's just that simple, that I don't understand. That is the root of the puzzle. Because we say we want to know the truth, but when it comes, we resist it. Isn't that strange? Yep. When Jesus is the truth, and we want to know him, so he comes and we resist it. So Satan is very cunning, he's very crafty. He works on serious Christians totally different than he works on either real carnal Christians, or the loss. So his three basic tactics is he deals with the lust of the flesh. So anything the pride of life and the pride of man and all those things he will tempt us with the, the, the pleasures of the flesh. Okay, so if you overcome that, you got saved and you realize you turned your back on all that kind of thing. And you know God wants to use you and you want to be used of God. He really doesn't care what you're doing as long as you're not threatening his kingdom. As long as you're not trying to destroy some work he's doing. And when you start doing that, then you become the target. You become the threat to his kingdom. And he's not just going to sit by and let you destroy his work without trying to keep you from doing it. So he immediately will form as a strategist that he thinks like a soldier. If you want to come up with some plan to keep you away from ever getting to the point you can destroy his work, or even finding out what his actual work is, or even if you found out what it was, to keep you ignorant of what you have to be able to destroy that work, so that you never get authorized to actually do it. All the work that Jesus did, if you put it all in, in one statement, he came to destroy the work of the devil. And that's where you came from. Father sent him here to destroy the work of the devil. Because every work that the devil has built in history is built on the foundation of lies. Now, if any of them disguise as truth to the lost and the ungodly, they're not even disguised. It's obvious, and everybody knows it. But for Christians, serious Christian. He's got to disguise it as something that's true, or we won't believe it. But that's still what it is, whether we know it's the lie or not, it still is a lie. And he will use things that are true to bring us to that conclusion. I shared that when I went through that first Corinthians 2 the last time, how about the cup of tea, remember I shared the illustration about the cup of tea, show how he could, easy he could do that in the natural. We hear that. 
But most people think still nice when he really can do that to me. <laughs> and you made that statement he already has. Because <laughs> it's just so easy for him to do it. You gotta give credit for credit's view. He is good in his job of being a deceiver. Yeah. Even the Lord gave him credit. Above every creature on this planet, he's the most cunning, crafty, deceitful person on this planet. Mm -hmm. Jesus gave him credit that is due him. He is deceiving. He is a liar. He's the whole thing. Cunning, crafty. So that if it possible, he would deceive even the very elect. So what does Satan come along and say to every Christian? Well, he can't deceive you because you're the very elect. <laughs> It's that one statement that's not the truth, <coughs> and we believe that, and therefore I can't be deceived. He's already got you. So, I mean, no matter what you come up with, he's got another comeback, so it's kind of like playing chess. Yeah, he makes a move, you got to make a move, and sooner or later he's going to checkmate you if you're not listening to the Lord. But if you listen to the Lord, you're going to put him in the corner and checkmate him, and he won't have any place to go. And he's got so you gotta understand the strategy involved. It's like playing a game of checkers or chess. The strategy involved. And most people don't think in those terms. So Satan's battle with us is, yes, he can attack your flesh and make you feel bad and use that to discourage you so you don't feel like doing something and all other kind of things and try to put depression on you and, and fears and all these things. He can use those tactics. But the main battle is between your ears. That's where the battle is, is in your mind. Because that's where you're coming to conclusions on things and determining what you're going to believe. Because we all have faith. As soon as you believe something, it doesn't matter if it's a truth or a lie, you release your faith into it and your faith activates that. It gives authority for that to come into being, whatever you believe. Satan is a thief. He's never given any authority by God. All authority in heaven and earth was given to Jesus. And only by Jesus shared it with was us. We're his joint heirs with him. He shared it with us. So Satan is a thief. So everything he has, he's had to have stolen it. So the authority that he has that he's controlling most of this planet now is stolen authority. And he's stolen from the church. Mm -hmm. Because we're the only one that has it. Right. Amen. And so part of us being an overcomer is I go back and take back what I gave him because he tricked me into giving it to him to start with. He deceived me into believing something was the truth that wasn't the truth. It was a lie. He just disguised that one. And I didn't check it in proper way. I went to my reasoning and understanding, came to the conclusion it made sense to me, so I released my faith into it. And now I just authorize that to be built in my life something false. <laughs> but I'm believing it's something good. And as soon as he did that, not only did he take me captive in that area, but the actual truth, he just stole it from me. Because I'm no longer looking for the truth on that subject, because I believe I already know it. That's where all the denominations are. They don't ever look at their doctrine. Because they believe they're all right. So they never look. They never hear anything here because they don't let anybody ask them their priests to stop part of the organization that believe the same way they do. Except for Linkler. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why Satan starts hassling. So, so he deceives, he separates us, then he starts deceiving us, then he starts conquering, and he starts taking our endurance away from us. So the tactics are mainly in the mind, so we were given an instruction, a simple instruction, to bring your thoughts under control in obedience to Christ. And the reason the church is where it's at, because it does not do that one single thing. It doesn't do that because Jesus is the functional Lord of our lives. We aren't trusting him with all of our heart. If we did, then we would do what he would say to do. We did trust in all of our heart. We would have no problem staying in His presence, because that would allow us to be in the kingdom and the spiritual realm. We'd have no problem with the communication, so we'd be able to bring the thoughts under control, ask Him, and get an answer. 
New Testament said. It's not complicated. How do you have a baby Christian? They just conditions for it. And if you don't think the condition, it's going to be not just hard, it's going to be impossible. So that's why most people find the communication part of what I'm talking about so ridiculously impossible. And that's true based on where they're functioning from. But all that is evidence from trying to communicate with God from the natural realm. In the spiritual realm, communication is easy. Those of you who had a serious conversion, if you ever really broke and you cried out to God and you had all that guilt and shame removed and you were translated out of darkness into peace for life, according to Colossians 1 13, where there was peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, it was in God's presence. Guess what? He was communicating to you then. You had no problem feeling his presence. You had a problem communicating. And you'd have been saved 30 seconds. <laughs> so one all had you down. It wasn't that hard. It should have gotten better from there, folks. It should have never changed. But we did not get the proper instruction. That's what the book Wake Up is about. Is going back and laying the spiritual foundation, the first work that should have been done the day we got saved, but it wasn't taught to us because the one that was teaching us, it wasn't taught to them. And the one that taught them, it wasn't taught to them either. So this has been passing down a long time. But it doesn't excuse anything. Because it's a curse and it just keeps passed from generation to generation. But so can blessings be passed from generation to generation. When are we going to stop the curse and change it to a blessing and pass the blessing to our children and our grandchildren? Well, this can go to three or four generations. I remember my dad telling me this back in the period of time when I didn't want to hear nothing. <laughs> but it stuck and God brought it back to me. And he was explaining cursing and blessings. And he said, my parents never asked my opinion about what they passed on to me. They passed on me what I'm sure they thought was right. But he said, but once it came to me, I would decide what I passed to my children, not my parents. Now, if it was a blessing, I realized it's a blessing. I, I'm going to be thankful for that. I'm going to be a good steward of it. I'm going to enjoy it. And I'm going to make sure I keep it. So when in the pass it on to my children, not only am I going to keep it, but I'm going to add a little bit to it. So I pass a little more on to my children that was passed to me with the same instruction. He said, now, if I realized something passed on to me, they might have thought it was the truth, but it wasn't. It was a, it was a curse. I'm not going to judge them that they deliberately passed that on. Because I know they love me, they want to deliberately do that, but don't mean they aren't wrong either. It's going to stop with me. I don't have to judge them to stop the fact that what they passed on was wrong. So it's going to stop with me, and I'm going to find out what the truth is, and I'm going to pass that on. So he said, that's what I've done with you. So the things that I've worked out in my life, and I've proven, did you enjoy them? But if one slips by me that wasn't the truth, and you discovered it wasn't, because I'm not delivering trying to do it, you make sure it stops with you that I don't have to answer for three or four generations for it. If you love me, you make sure it stops with you. So it should have gotten better every generation. There have been less and less error, more and more truth coming. It's gone just the opposite for the last 2,000 years. We get less and less truth passed on, we get more and more of the curses and the lies passed on. That's just where we are. Now, the world has the eyes of its choice because with their natural mind, they can't really figure the thing out. But some of them, at least even in the natural, figure some things aren't good that was passed on. And they stop it, and they're not even Christians. They realize it's not right. But the church as a whole, we just keep passing it on. And what we're passing on is the ways that seem right. That was never tested properly. And we just pass it on. And that's how the denomination go from generation to generation. Nobody changes any doctrine. Nobody questions anything. If you do, you get the left foot of fellowship. You get kicked out. That's kind of that. You get attacked. So Satan has all kinds of tactics 
The exciting thing is, though, the Holy Spirit in us, remember in the first Corinthians 2, it said in the Spirit realm, only the Holy Spirit can reveal the spiritual. Mm -hmm. Only the Holy Spirit. Right. Now, he can do it through me or your pastor or you or somebody else, but it has to be him. If I had any truth, it came from him. Right. It didn't originate in me. Understand? It came to me, and he can pass that on through me. But as children of God, we have direct access. And you should be generally getting it directly from him. So that process of learning to and growing, the Holy Spirit is in John is to reveal the things of the kingdom, our inheritance. But also in Satan's kingdom, which is also the spiritual realm. Nobody from the natural, it doesn't say it in that scripture, but it's true. Nobody from the natural can understand his realm either and how it functions. That's why we're so ignorant of his devices. Mm -hmm. But the Holy Spirit knows everything about his kingdom and knows every type that he has and why it works and everything that he brings to God is the truth that is alive. And that spirit lives in us 24-7, authorized to teach us all things and lead us into all truth. How can he lead me into all truth if he doesn't expose the lies that I'm believing that is also true? So he's got to know what the lie is to expose it before he return it. So I'm going to go through just a few tactics that Satan uses and I think it's still in our inheritance. Do you ever think much about your inheritance? We know we got saved when we become a joint heir with Jesus Christ. We all believe we're going to heaven. And most Christians don't get much past that. We know we're supposed to go to heaven. We know we're God's children. We're joined heir with Jesus. And we're supposed to be ruling and reigning with Him in eternity. We're going to get a glorified body that doesn't get old, it doesn't get sick, and no more sorrow, no more pain. So we know these basic things. But not too much more beyond that do we understand about the spiritual realm whatsoever. Because it's unseen now. We can't see it. We're yearning for Jesus to come back to where he will be in a physical form that we can see. And that's going to be exciting. We look forward to going to heaven until we get there. It'll be in a physical form in a sense that we'll be able to see the image of that. But the kingdom of God is here now in the spiritual realm, and we can't see that. Yet the Bible says all the things that we can see on this earth are temporary. They're going to sooner or later pass away, including us and everything on this planet, including the planet. But the part that we can't see, the spiritual realm, is eternal. It's not going to pass away. So that's here now. So I'm not, I'm not sharing on the kingdom right now, but I just want to make sure you understand that. So Satan knows exactly what our heritage is. He knows exactly what the conditions are, if there are any conditions for it, or if it's just automatic. So some things are automatic, but most of them have some condition. But most of our, none of our heritage has anything to be earned. You can't do anything to earn it. It's by grace through faith. But faith is trusting God for following God's instructions. I trust Him. He says, dot the sign across His feet. I dot the sign across His feet just because He said it, if that's the condition. So it's important that if I'm believing for something, that either I receive it, and the problem is my faith's not working properly, we worked on that, but if that's working properly and it's not happening, then at least I need to consider what are the conditions for it. That's why it's so important to have the communication working, because all you're going to do is ask the Holy Spirit, are there conditions for this? Is this available for me now? Because the question is, is it available now? Is it only for eternity, or is it some level of maturity? I need to know these things. Mm -hmm. But we're heirs. So, you don't wait till we're dead and everything's over before you get anything. There's got to be something here now. The very fact we have the Holy Spirit in us is the earnest of our inheritance. Right. 
So let's start in there. So what does that involve now? This, Jesus shows a lot of things that you're heir to that is available now about inheritance that most people aren't enjoying. When Jesus and the Holy Spirit comes in you, he's going to be in you, he's going to teach you all things. So you're heir in God's kingdom, so you've been authorized to have the best teacher in the universe that will teach you everything, that will reveal Jesus to you, and will lead you into all truth. That's your heritage. And it's in you now. So why aren't we receiving that? Because there's some conditions to it. We were never taught what the conditions were. Most of them was even identified what is available. Mm -hmm. For example, like the kingdom of God is available. The gift of eternal life is available now. They both have conditions. That's pretty big if you think about the gift of eternal life. That I can know the Father in Jesus. That I can meet the condition that they actually come and set up their home, their boat, and be according to John 14. Make your home boat and start revealing and manifesting themselves to me. So they can be clearly seen and known to them. That's part of our inheritance. That's in the gift of eternal life, but it has condition. I go all over the world, nobody even knew what the promise was, what the, the gift was, let alone the conditions. Satan had stolen that, something that openly in the gospel of John that everybody has read, but they never had ears to see. So the battle is in their mind, and if we're not acknowledging the Lord, bringing the thoughts under control and acknowledging the Lord, then it's easy for him to steal from us. We read the story about Esau and how he sold his birthright for a meal bowl of boards or something to eat because he was hungry. So he was just hungry and he wants to eat bad enough that he did something stupid and he sold his natural birthright not even realize what he was doing. But he did it. And later on when he realized what a dumb mistake he had made and he tried to fix it and he was totally willing to repent and change it he could find no place of repentance. It was too late to do anything about it. So he lost his birthright for a bowl of food. And we looked at that and said, man, that is foolish. Now this is in the natural realm. So what was his birthright worth? And that day and time, it was pretty sizable. But it's still a temporal thing. But it was a lot to give up for a bowl of food. Well, you're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. You're heirs of the kingdom. So all the things that you're heir to, how much are you giving up? Are you selling for something <coughs> like a bowl of porridge that's not worth much? Or are you allowing the enemy to steal from you? And you don't even know he's stealing it from you. Or even if you do, you won't make the effort to go get it back. What's going to happen if we let this go and our time runs out and we're standing before the Lord in judgment and we realize it's time we're waiting for our inheritance, we already gave it away. We've already sold it, we let somebody steal it. How much is going to be gone? That's pretty frightening. Because sin can steal our soul, but he can steal our inheritance. Now, I believe there's some inheritance he can't get to. But there's an awful lot that he can. The kingdom of God is here now. It's been here for the last 2,000 years. So as soon as the church age started, the kingdom came by the spiritual realm. And it's been here a place for us to safely live where saints should have no access to you whatsoever. The only access he has to you is through that old nature. And he was, we were given a new nature, told him to bury the old nature, and God within the new nature would create in us a new creation. And this new in the Greek means an original creation. So from that new nature who was given, Jesus being the functional Lord of your life, he's going to create 
a unique person in you. There would be no other Christian like that in the world. Yet you still have his similarities. You have his DNA, so to speak. Because in the old nature, we have the DNA of our parents. But in the new nature, we have the DNA of our Heavenly Father and the Lord. And so he's creating a new one there. And the key, the key was, bury the old one. But we don't do that. We keep the old one alive. Because that's the only place we can play Lord. Because <laughs> we can't be Lord in the new one. You can't be in the kingdom of God and be Lord. But we've never taught this even kingdom of God here to start with. So why do we ever go, how do we ever go about learning how to get in it, how to stay in it, what are the conditions living in it? It's irrelevant because it's not going to show up again until Jesus comes and set up his kingdom on this earth. That's what doctrine we believe. I've never been to any denomination on this planet that has part of their doctrines of the kingdom of God as the last 2,000 years it being here and how to function in it. Yet, there's all kind of clear scriptures on it. When we got saved, we were delivered out of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Amen. Well, where is that kingdom? So based on what we think we know in our doctrines, it's in the third heaven. And we're waiting on Jesus to come back and set up a literal kingdom on this earth. And in between, we're just waiting. So where did he put us that day we got saved? Because the Romans 14, 17 said there will be peace and there will be joy in the Holy Spirit. He told the Pharisees and them, it's not coming with observation, it's going to be in you, it's going to come in great power. So on the day of Pentecost, that came. But we were never taught the spiritual things or how to function in the spiritual world. So we could not understand anything about that. We had no choice but to function out of the natural and try to be spiritual. But you cannot be spiritual from the natural. Everything in the natural is condemned. You can be a good Lord or you can be a bad Lord. That's your choice. But you're still being Lord. And all Satan has to do is if he can keep us in that nature because we're eager to there's any other way to function, he's got an access to it. So we've got this harassment going on in our own lives. We never really totally get free from him. Ministers have to deal with the same thing, just being aggravated by him, when he shouldn't have any business in our affairs at all. I mean, he had his time with me. I don't serve him no more. I serve the Lord. So what I do is none of his business. Even if I make a mistake, it's none of his business. God didn't hire the devil to spank me if I did something wrong. <laughs> And my dad said, if I need my breeches dusted, he'll dust them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I need a correction, my father would do that. He didn't hire the devil to do it. Yeah. Yet many Christians stand around and let the devil beat you up because you did something wrong. And it makes you think God is so angry at you, you need to let him cool off before you get around him again. So you stay away from him. In the meantime, he's kicking you around and you're rocking everything. I mean, it just, I mean, he's just ridiculous. I'm just telling you. If you understand his tactics, it gives you the why and why did I ever put up with that kind of mess? I'm not trying to exalt me, but I'm just, I'm trying to share not me from an apostolic mess, but me from a child of God. Because all the fundamentals that I teach, even who's the book, Wake Up, many of you have read that. All that I saw when taught me by the Holy Spirit when I was still a baby or maybe or a toddler at best. Not a ministry. It never entered my mind I'd be a minister. The only thing I swore I would be. When all that was taught to me, and I could consistently stay in His presence and have clear communication. And the devil had no place. In. My old nature was dead. I could consistently walk in the new nature. And it was clear evidence and proof that God was creating a new creation in me. Because I was consistently changing. Every day something else was passing away. Something was coming here. He didn't just work on the weekends or when I was off. Every day something was processing out and coming in. So the growth was, was serious growth. 
And yes, in the beginning, when those guys are ignorant of how to be in the spirit, walk in the realm, because I was still in the natural, trying to be spiritual. Yes, Satan had access, and he aggravated and he bothered me. But when I would come to the Holy, the Holy Spirit, the teacher, I need to understand what are the rules of the kingdom of God. I mean, the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. And in Matthew 6, he, he told them to pray like this. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Your will be done in earth just like it is in heaven. So the same rule that's done in heaven, the same rule in the millennial kingdom, is exactly the same rule that's in the kingdom of God here in the spiritual realm. So I want to know what are the do's and the don'ts? What are the rules? How do you function in this? Because God is a God of order. If we follow rules, we get by fine. The United States is a, is a nation of rules. We follow the rules and we can enjoy being an American citizen, but you go out and rob a bank or you shoot somebody or you start breaking the rules, then there's consequences for it. That's just common sense. There's no difference in God's kingdom. There's consequences for breaking his rule. Oh, he's more gracious, he's more merciful. He's a much better judge than that face. <laughs> but I need to learn these, so I was learning these situations and I was learning the tactics that at the same time I'm trying to learn how God's kingdom is functioning, I'm also being taught how Satan's kingdom is functioning, so I didn't keep yielding to it and falling into his ways and seems right. I've shared before the Proverbs 14, 12, that's one of Satan's favorite things to do. Is there is a way that seems right, but it still leads to destruction. And he, that's what he's coming up with us. He comes to that age of life that I shared in the second previous lady, left that he comes imitating God because you haven't been taught how to hear the voice of the Lord, you haven't been taught how to check it properly, then it's easy to get a thought that sounds right, especially if he's using scriptures to bring you to conclusion when you don't actually test the conclusion. You don't have the Lord confirm it through the witness of the Holy Spirit. The, the words not being rightly divided. You don't bother to study and lose it, look up any other scriptures on that subject before we believe it. We just take that as a belief. This other thing that amazes me when you're dealing with it. You're either a carnal Christian or you're a spiritual Christian. We don't like the word carnal, but it simply means natural. If you're functioning from the natural realm, you're a carnal Christian. That's predominantly the way you function, you're a carnal Christian. If you basically are functioning from the spiritual realm, which you cannot do if you're not humble and if you're not acknowledging the Lord and doing what He said, if you're not walking in that new nature, then you're not in the spiritual realm. It's just simple as that. So you're not a spiritual Christian. It don't mean that we don't humble ourselves and get spiritual from time to time. But if you look at what are you, generally, nobody's perfect. You're not perfectly wrong or perfectly right. But there's got to be enough majority of who are you wrong. What is, what is, what is your characteristic, even though we all have some flaws? But generally, who are you? You're either an overcomer or you ain't overcome. There's so many provisions in the kingdom that's our heritage that's based on your being an overcomer. There's seven letters to the churches in Asia in Revelation 2 and 3. The end of every one of those letters is said to those who overcome, I will grant something. So this is heritage that he's granted. You ought to read that. Because you'll see that every one of them is a condition on the fact that you overcame. And a lot of the time you read, you're going to find out, uh oh, what do you mean I've got to overcome? I thought that's automatic just because I'm born again. You'd be surprised how many of those things you think is automatic, it's not automatic. That it has conditions. It's the same thing, we're all Christian, we're all going to come back to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years, are we? Then you might have tried a lot of scriptures out of the Bible because there's a whole lot of places that gives conditions for that. Revelation 17, 14, it describes those that's going to come and rule with Christ. They're called, they're chosen, and they are faithful. Those three things. That means, call means what does God invite you to do in the body of Christ? Who are you in the body of Christ? You don't know who it is, you've accepted that. 
chosen means he's accepted you. He's prepared you and accepted you in that position, which means he's anointed you. I've shared over the anointing the last time I was here. And you're faithfully going by his being the Lord in your life, functioning in what you're called to do. That's what those three things mean. And that's who he says he's going to come and rule and reign with him. Does that fit the body of Christ around the world? Not even remotely. Because to be even fit in the body of Christ, whether you prepare to true or not, it starts with a little hardship to each thing Lord in your life. When you read the Bible ministry in Ephesians 4, they were giving for the equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. So you grow up. Not because to and fro they were wedded in doctrine, but you grow up to the measure of the statue of Christ. So whatever measure of that body we are in Christ, you grow up to that, fitly joined to the head. Connected to the head, and every member fitly joined. Colossians said, God decides places in the body where he, where, where he chooses to put us. You don't get to decide. So God is the one who decides that. Can we function there and allow God to prepare so that there can be something effectually worked in us? And that's what we supply with each other. And you supply me what's been effectually worked in you. And the result is the entire body is edified and built up in love. So that's the whole situation. So Satan did anything to move it away from there. Because if we're going to be in the body of Christ, how can you be in the body of Christ with everybody's ahead? Because <laughs> if you've been Lord of your life, you're the head of your life. And they're not room but one head in the body of Christ. And he's already got his head. <laughs> he doesn't need another head. So if I insist on being the head or Lord of my life, then I disqualify myself from being connected to him. It's the same thing John 15, abide in the vine. He is the vine. You can't bear fruit without being there. So the fruits of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, are not going to be regular in your life if you're not functioning there. And you can't stay in the vine if you're not acknowledging the vine and doing what the vine is saying. As soon as you become Lord, you're just disconnected yourself. And the vine starts drying up. So we keep splicing back in, repenting, going out. But we never stay long enough for a consistent fruit to come. So I'm going to go through just a few things that Satan is using to steal our inheritance. And this is not by any remotely is this a exhaustive teaching on this. And this one of to get you thinking a little bit and just see the simple tactic he uses. For serious Christians, Satan tactics are designed to keep us, first of all, ignorant of our inheritance. Secondly, and the conditions for receiving it. So I'd ask myself, has he been doing a pretty good job of that? Well, Two things that I preach on a lot that I feel like the absolute most important thing about inheritance was the gift of eternal life. John 17, 3, that we can actually know the Father and Jesus. I've never met a man in any denomination on this planet that anybody has ever taught that seminar. Not the first one. Not the first one. Forty some years I haven't found anybody that was taught that. Clearly, openly, in the Gospel of John, we never saw it. Why? Because when you read the Gospel of John from the natural mind, they can't understand the things of the Spirit. And also, the number one hindrance when I ask God, why do your children not know the things I know you want them to know? He gave me the number one reason is because of what we already think we know. Because when you think you know something, you release your faith into it, and that's what you believe, and you're no longer looking for any answers on that subject. And even if you see something contrary to what you believe, you just kind of blame, go over it, it doesn't register. So if you already think you know what eternal life is, if you read John 17 first, it doesn't click. You just go right over. And that's the most great gospel that in here. So every real Christian has read John several times, yet if I pass out a slip of paper, what is eternal life? Nobody puts that answer down. Most will put down eternal life as we will live for eternity. 
And that's true, we will live in prayer, but that's not to get to eternal life. So it's not the truth, but we believe that to be the truth. So we're not looking for anything else on that subject, we know the answer. And anytime anything comes on, even a scripture contrary to that, we just go right past it. When I share about the kingdom of God, no denomination that I go to has anywhere in their doctrine about the kingdom of God being here now, and especially how to function in it. They have the third heaven, they have the millennial kingdom coming, and they have the eternal kingdom when the Father comes and creates everything new. That's all they got. So what do you do when you read scripture that talks about the kingdom of God that's here now that Jesus preached about? I've got a book back here this thick on the kingdom of God now. That this that thing's got a little over a thousand scriptures in it. Listening to the other kingdoms and the one that's here now. Nobody teaches on that thing. Yet Jesus taught on it. He taught more on that than any other subject. All the subjects put together was not as much as he taught on the kingdom of God that we're talking about now. He made statements that does not line up what we believe. He was telling the disciples in John 14 about when he goes, he needs to go away and the Holy Spirit's coming, but he was telling in John 18 that 14, 15, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Verses 21 and 23, we talked about those who hear him doing his commandments when the Father of Jesus would come. So that's to get to turn by functioning. But in verse 18, he told them, he said, I won't leave you covered. Listen, talking to his disciples, he said, I will come to you. Now, I guess any preacher that I did back then, where's the Father and where's Jesus? So this is the two that I'm supposed to get to know of in eternal life. And they explained the throne and the third heaven, and that's where they said in Jesus' right hand. And the third part of the Trinity, the Holy Ghost is here. So two's in the third heaven, which is beyond our galaxy, millions of light years away. And the Holy Spirit is here. So how can I get to know the two that's millions of light years away? you got to be in the presence. How do I get this presence? Well, that's where we have a problem. you got to die. That's the only answer I can. you got to die to go there. I didn't want to die. I just wanted to know. <laughs> So you just give up. It doesn't make any sense. So did Jesus lie to the disciples? We know he doesn't lie, yet based on what we think we know doctrinally, he did. You're saying because he did not come. Those guys have been dead two thousand years. And he did not come based on what most people look like they know about God's kingdom. So he either lied, or either, that's not canon, that's not scripture, it shouldn't be in there. Somebody stuck that verse in there and he didn't actually say that. So which one of those two are you going to believe? You don't believe either one of those two. But it doesn't line up with what you think you know, so what do you do to the scripture like that? It's simple, you just ignore it and go on before you get in trouble. That's all you do. <laughs> that's right. You get over to Mark 9, 1, and again he tells these same disciples, some of you here are not going to see death until you see the kingdom of God coming in great power. They're all dead. They would have been waiting 2,000 years for that kingdom to come. What do you do with those scriptures? Ignore them. Jesus was preaching all the time about the kingdom of God. In Luke 17, 20, and 21, the Pharisees got aggravated and they didn't ask him. They demanded him, when is this kingdom going to come you're talking about? And he did say, it's when I return back to this earth that I put down all the rule and reign. That's what his answer. He said the kingdom is not going to come with observation. Nobody's going to say, here it is, there it is. It's going to be in you. How much sense did that make to them? Because they all knew the scriptures, they were looking for that millennial kingdom to come. <laughs> so that made no sense. And how hard would it be to get in it? Verse 20, verse 17, chapter uh, 20, 17, 20, Luke 20, 17. 
except you come as a little child, you will no wise enter into this kingdom. Matthew 6, 33, he told the people that are struggling over your daily needs, get your priorities straight. Seek first the kingdom of God. And his right said, everything will be added. He's talking to most people then. Well, they have been awful hungry before they got ahead of him. They had to wait till they got to the kingdom of God. They had to come for 2,000 years, so they all did. <laughs> So why did he preach that? So I'm just saying, I go on and on. It, it's just ridiculous based on what we think we know. We read the scriptures, but not all of them click. Because it doesn't line with what we think we know. Just like, as important as the gift of eternal life, and I use that because I think that's the most important thing we've got in our inheritance. So if Satan could get us to believe a lie, and blind us that we read that scripture over and over and it never registered that that's different than what we're believing, then how hard are we going to be to deceive us on something that is less right? It's ridiculous. So I'm just going to make two things that, that comes in salvation that hardly any of the church was ever taught and never learned and has operation or not. One is that gift of eternal life. So you can have that personal intimate relationship that only comes by spending quality time in its present, clear two-way communication about everything and it being the functional Lord of your life, directing your step. So the scripture like Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 would be a normal, should be normal for all Christians. Trust the Lord with all your heart. That's the Lord's step. Do not leave your own understanding. That's how we practice being the Lord. But in all your ways acknowledge him, and for he shall direct your step. So it's not complicated. I trust him with all of my heart. I can't leave him all understanding. That is the opposite. I still gotta make a decision, so I believe to stand there and look dumb until I die. Or I say, Lord, what do you want me to do? And if I do that, then he'll direct my step. And I obey that direction for one simple reason, because I love him. He said, John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandment. So that's how I express love. When I do that, not only do I show him that I love him, but I so love into God, and he is love. And whatever you show him, you're going to reach, so I get love back, when I get more back than so. And so the love of God starts growing in my life. But just this little simple process. And that started with me when I was a baby. So if these clear scriptures, the spiritual foundation was given to us of who we are and what should be going on in the beginning, and if you come as a baby and everybody else in the church has been doing that for years and has pro proven they've been doing it, and they show you the clear scriptures, when you had that childlike faith, you would not have doubted whatsoever. They showed you the clear scripture, you would have simply believed it, and you went functioning right on and you never in your mind that would be hard. I showed the pastor, I didn't want to have about three of them. The little book back there, and my daughter writes, on the My Secret, My Voice, Children's Edition. This was written 20 years ago. When her grandchildren, she had five kids, and her grandchildren were small, because they were too small to read the regular My Secret, My Voice. But the parents love the Lord, they did that. All our friends that they have as part of our ministry, they all did that. And so they're teaching these principles to the children. So I had her take each chapter of my sheep here, my voice, condense it down in clear, simple language that a child can understand for just a one or two paragraphs of the, the, the theme of that particular chapter and have them draw a sheet cartoon illustrating the doing of whatever that was. Not hearing the word, but actually doing for well, that chapter of the instruction. And when it's two years old, give it to them. Every one of my five grandchildren, I'm the two, three, and four year old, could hear the Lord. Guaranteed it's better than most pastors can hear the Lord. <laughs> now, that don't mean they're perfect, but it never entered my, their mind that the Lord wouldn't answer them. Because he answers mom and daddy all the time, he answers me and your papi all the time, every time they go to them, they say, they want to do something, let me ask the Lord. So they hear us doing that all the time, they see that all the time, and so they had no doubt whatsoever, 
And you say, were they born again then? No, they weren't born again. But they're still going to be heirs because their parents, who their parents was, and they were under that covering, and God gave them grace. I wasn't saying the first time about it talking to me either. Did you? <laughs> if he didn't talk to us when we were lost, we'd never gotten saved. But he's communicating to us when we lost. You don't have to be a Christian for him to communicate with you. You hear what I'm saying? So they're still the covenant. So they would pray. So typically, then, every one of the children, if they want to go put up their friends, the first thing my daughter asked him is, did you ask the Lord? Ask the Lord if he wants you to do that. And I'll confirm it. Now, in the beginning, yes, they get selfish action. They get what they want to hear. <laughs> but, very good, but then when she corrected him, that wasn't the Lord. Then, then that you was wrong. And then adjusted. So it's amazing many times that three, four, and five years old, hard things that they would not want to do or, or something they want to do so bad, they can still hear the Lord not do that. They can see the illustration. I once they came and everybody in their school was celebrating Halloween. And they wanted to go trick-or-treating. And they go ask Mama if we can go trick-or-treating. And she said, no, I said, that happens, we can't go do that. Cynthia said, well, let's just ask the Lord. So she asked the Lord, do you want to go trick-or-treating? And the Lord said, no. But instead of just leaving to get that, they said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord told us specific something to go do. <coughs> so she shared with him, no, the Lord doesn't want you to do that. And she shared with him why. And they looked sad for a moment, but this is what the Lord wants us to do. And she took them to some fun place, and they went out and had a big time, and a lot bigger time than their friends had going trick or treating. So it wasn't like, you know, he gave the devil a door so they didn't sit there and feel rejected. They didn't get through anything. All the friends were talking about how much fun they had when they were treating. If you can't do the wrong thing, then what is some right thing you can do? So we get caught up in the, the dog and said, don't get into the deuce. <laughs> if there's a dog that wants to do it, here's that. Because God should have a better way. So what they did was a lot more fun than what their friends was doing. And the next time their friends wanted to go with them to go do what they did. <laughs> Not go do that. The right way got nothing. One of my associates, one of the ones I was training, he had seven, he had eight children, seven boys, and one girl. He had a big suburban and at the church he was and now they look for a stop to get something to eat. So he said, Yeah, your fascination got tough today about acknowledging the Lord and everything. And so there's everybody praying to ask the Lord where he wants us to go eat. And one of his boys is about five years old, sitting all the way in the back. And they're looking real quiet, and all of a sudden, the dad heard, McDonald's. <laughs> real said, that's strange, you guys sound an awful lot like guys as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't mean they're still kids. Right. But the principles was being taught. <clears throat> but anyway, that's interesting. That old child book I did, it's been out for 20 years. But I took it to Ireland the first time and it showed some people in the meeting and there's some older people there, so they all got one to give to their grandchildren. But when I come back the next time, before they gave it to the grandchildren, they had read it. And I come back, they were all excited. They said, wow, I didn't know that's what I was supposed to get out of that chapter. <laughs> <laughs> so they read another book, didn't do anything, but they read this and got all excited because they could actually do something, you know. Then they're gone long enough, they're supposed to be doing something. But this is a very simple illustration, and they just started practicing. They got more out of the one we given to the small children than they were to the and their grandparents. So that's interesting. So, this basic inheritance of eternal mind and the kingdom of God, and just how to be spiritual, the difference between the natural and the spiritual, we weren't taught. 
And because we were, we still need everything else. Because to me, that's the most valuable thing. All your inheritance is in the kingdom. <laughs> it's in Christ. Everything is in, in the spirit, in Christ, in the kingdom. It's in Christ Jesus. All the promises are what? Yes. But it's conditional. It's in Christ. Not in the flesh. Or we'll be ignored. You don't meet the conditions for it. But if you're in Christ, then whatever heritage is available to you now, the Holy Spirit will start qualifying you for it. Whatever the conditions are, He systematically is going to meet those conditions so that you can keep inheriting more and more and more of your heritage. The scripture that I didn't know at the time was, I just started doing that. The John 14, just to show God that love you. That I call that particular scripture the truth of how we express love to God. I call that a master key. Because I learned that very early. And just using that, all the doors and everything else I got was in a lot of bitches doing that. Everything in all the books over there, all that revelation, everything I had in my relationship with God came by using one simple key. You could have a thousand room hotel now they got the car but we go back when we had keys, okay? <laughs> yeah. You had a thousand room hotel and every room had a different key. It only opened that one room. If the owner had a master key, he could open one thousand doors with one key. Mm -hmm. We'd go around gathering keys and open a door and we join what's behind that, or we'd get a master key that can open all the doors. That love relationship with God is a master key. My motivation 100% was when I sought God for direction was to show him, to have an opportunity to show him through my obedience and my love to him. I didn't understand it then, but when I did that, whatever measure of love it took to trust him and obey that, I sowed that into him. I sowed a God in love that he given me. And I reaped the God they love and always got more back. So the love of God started growing dramatically in me. And that's a whole other testimony. So what the Holy Spirit was doing when he was telling me to do something then, whatever the next part of my inheritance he wanted me to receive or qualify me for, then the things he would speak to me, the Holy Spirit would speak to me, quit doing this, start doing this, he was qualified me for the next blessing, the next part of my inheritance. And then all of a sudden, there it was. And I didn't ask for it, I wasn't even seeking it. I'm just seeking him to show him that I love him. In the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 28, Jesus said, the Lord said before Israel, blessings and curses. And he gave him a condition for the blessing and the condition for the curses. It's very simple. He said, if you will hearken to it, that means you take the initiative to seek God. Another your heart can do it to the voice of the Lord your God to do all he commands you to do this day, the daily thing, then he's going to set you on hinds, he's going to make the head not the tail, and he's going to cause all these blessings to come on you and overtake you. And it is several verses of blessing. So it doesn't matter where you live, if you, I'll bless you in the city, I'll bless you in the country. I'll bless you going in, I'll bless you going out. This is the one I like then. Whatever you put your hands to, I will bless it. But you see, if he's directing me, I will put my hands to nothing he didn't direct me to do. So whatever he directed me to do, he's authorized that, and the Spirit of the Lord is on me to enable me to do that, and he blesses it. The one I like is that the enemy comes at you in one direction, he was scattered in seven different directions. Now, if you notice the blessing will come on you and overtake you, you're driving down the interstate. And a car comes on you and overtakes you. Is it coming towards you or from behind you? It's coming from behind. So he said, You hearken diligent to my voice to do what I'm commanding you to do, and these blessings will come on you and overtake you. Which means you're not looking for the blessing. I'm not looking for any blessing. I'm just seeking God for what he wanted to do this day to show him that I loved him. Then all of a sudden I met the condition and I look, oop, I kind of get bumped and there would be a blessing. If you're running 50, the blessing becomes a 60. 
<laughs> you're going 120 and becoming 140. You couldn't get in a fighter jet now, brother Buster. I'm serious. They will come on your day. So I can list off blessing after blessing after blessing God has given me. And I challenge you to find any one of those blessings I ever asked for in the sense that I was pursuing that. Other than the gift of eternal life. I want you to know. I asked for that. Other than that, you decide what I need next. And I'm basically sharing this with the Lord. Lord says, anything, whatever you want to do, if there's anything in me that would hinder you, you show me, I'll repent of it. If there's anything I should be doing that I'm not doing, you show me, and I'll do it. And other than that, it's in your hand. And that's all I did. And I did what he said because I loved him. So I didn't care what the commandment was. But he qualified me one thing after the other, not only growing spiritually, but then the things I need in this level that would be a blessing to him that I could handle them and not be a curse to me at that point. He added these things to me. And it just kept increasing. I have a nice home, I have a nice car. God tells you anybody to go to my home, my car, anything in my house and find anything, I just decided to go get those I wanted. You won't find anything in that house that I didn't know the Lord about. Either I felt on my heart about something, so I checked it with him as he wanted me to do this, or he took the initiative to say it's time to do that. So I had no guilt about it. Well, you could use it that way to give it to missions, or you could have done this. No, I couldn't because I've done that, I've been disobeying God. Yeah. Because I don't have anything, everything I have is his. Yeah. yeah, we get hung up on things like the tithe, for example. Well, now that's Old Testament. Yeah, the Old Testament had to give the tithe. That don't really apply, but the church will make sure it applies to the New Testament because we've got a function. Mm -hmm. But we're still thinking tithe is 10%. And in the Old Testament, under the Old Law, yes, they gave 10%. And the other night, they gave you what they wanted to do with it. We think the New Testament, everybody keeps thinking the New Testament is easier. It's far more demanding than the Old Testament was. It just got better equipment to do it with. So in the New Testament, the whole hundred percent is his. And he directs me on what I do with the whole hundred percent. Now the ten percent goes to his earth, fine. But he has still acknowledged him on the other ninety two. Was he doing that? He was Lord of everything. It's his. So he's invested. So anyway. Some of the things you say that keeps us blind in problem is make sure I keep my time on straight here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'll give you another one. Okay, so obviously you still have the eternal life, the kingdom of God, and how to be spiritual roads of natural. Folks, that's about as big as you can get. That's serious. But once he's done those three things. Everything else is a piece of cake for him. I mean, it's easy. He's already stolen the most important things of our inheritance already. What is critical about this is not just what he's stolen for now, because I have fellowship with God. I don't have fears. I don't have anxieties. I don't worry about anything. The devil doesn't have access to me. I don't spend any time about the devil. I haven't spoke to the devil. I can't even remember when. <laughs> that I haven't spoke to the devil. And that's I'm helping somebody else and I dress them to run away from them and give them a break. Or we found that the last time he ever remotely tried to threaten me was probably 2019, 27, 8 years ago. First time I was going to Africa. And I'm flying into the military, a uh, country that had just been taken over the military coup with every morning in the world. You don't go there under those no conditions. All police was abandoned in the whole country, the total military. It was a dangerous place. Bandits were crazy. And God tells me to go there. Didn't know it. They have never been there before. And they're getting close to time to go. And the devil spoke to me and said, When you get to Nigeria, I'm going to kill you. He saw some boom. That's all. I have basically a patent answer for the devil when he threatened me. First thing I do is I laugh. 
<laughs> the second thing I say is take your best shot. I don't think you can do it. But my basic response in our lives, I said, Well, if you're going to kill me, why are you going to wait till I get to Nigeria? You need some help, you're not able to get it done. <laughs> I said, If you think you can destroy me, why don't you do it right now? You know, and why are you going to wait to get that? You've got to have somebody prop you up. He didn't kill me, it would be bothering me. But he didn't kill me. He never saw me anybody say, go. Somebody said, well, how do you know you're not going to get killed when you go there? I said, well, it's simple, because before I went to Africa, I'd already prayed through where God wanted me to go to the next, and that was England. And how can you send me to England if you don't give me back to Nigeria? <laughs> <laughs> I always make sure I keep one or two. Every <laughs> <laughs> kid where I don't have one back to his, see if I get a little nervous in there. So I always make sure this is where we're going next. If I'm doing what he's saying, that don't mean I couldn't get stupid and get this out of But if I'm acknowledging doing what he said, then they don't doubt my mind, I will come back. No weapon born against me is going to prosper. Okay, so I'm not able to say the device. Okay, so here's some more tactics that he uses. I'm not going to place my introduction here, brother. I've got a lot to go. Okay. Number one, he will bring away, I've already shared this so much, ways to sin, drive, and Proverbs 14, 12. So that's a tactic he uses. It's because we're functioning in the natural. So he can use that process of things that are true, leaving out other key things to easily bring us. To the conclusion. So it's ways to sin. And that's what most serious Christians fall upon. That's where all the false denominations came from, exactly that method. Next, he gets us trying to do spiritual things from the natural realm. That's one of his tactics. If you're determined to want to be spiritual, then he's not going to resist you trying to do that. He's just going to get you to do it some way that doesn't work. So he don't mind you trying to be spiritual from the natural realm, but he knows it's not possible to be spiritual from the natural realm. Because as long as you're in the natural realm, you're in his realm of darkness, and he has access to you. And God's not going to back you up, because God's actually going to resist you. You realize that? If you're functioning from the natural realm, you're in pride, and God resists the proud. You hear that? You know why so many people have such a big devil in their mind? It is because they're trying to be spiritual in the natural, and they can't get anywhere, no matter how much they rebuke and bind and Satan and threaten and do everything else. They keep getting stopped. And you know what? It's just what? The devil does not resist the proud. He encourages them. God resists the proud. And the devil turns around and tries to make us think that's him resisting this. And we're trying to rebuke him, which makes him look big because he doesn't know anyone. So it isn't watching him. You can't rebuke the Lord in the name of Jesus and get him to go. He doesn't go anywhere. So again, as being ignorant of those ways, God out of love is resisting us because we're going the wrong direction. If he doesn't resist us, Satan takes us right into destruction. That's the way that seems right. Remember, the end of it is destruction. If God didn't resist us, we'd go right into destruction. Then the devil turned around and gives an opinion to God because he makes it so hard. I mean, he's very subtle in these things. Next, he keeps us ignorant of God or sharing about the kingdom of God and especially how to live in it. In 2 Timothy 2, 25 to 26, he's continually taking us captive and getting us to release our faith in something that seems right. Again, if you look at that scripture, he can take, in the natural, he can take you captive at his will. So it's easy to get you to believe something. I like to I'm already shared this. I'm not going to go into details on that. The next one, though, uh, he's causing doubt and questioning in our mind about the love, the trustworthiness, and the faithfulness of God. He really loves doing that. Creates doubts in our mind about God's love, His trustworthiness, and His faithfulness, 
And all that doubt keeps us from ever trusting God in our God, which means we can't build the Lordship issue, which means we can't live in the kingdom of God. So all that other doubt line, he gets it in perfect. If we're not in the kingdom of God, we're no threat to his kingdom. So he has neutralized us as any threat to his kingdom. According to John 1, Jesus is the Word. Think about this. Agree, Jesus is the Word. Mm-hmm. He's also the truth. And when the Holy Spirit reveals any of the Word of God to us, He reveals the truth. Think about this. Our reaction and our attitude towards the truth is our reaction and attitude towards Jesus. That's exactly what you see. When the Holy Spirit blessed those who have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. So if God blessed you enough to open your eyes and give you ears to hear truth, which everybody doesn't get a chance to do it, then the Holy Spirit's job, one of his job is to reveal Jesus to you. So if he reveals truth to you, he just reveals part of Jesus to you. So your reaction to that truth, that word, is the Lord saying exactly your reaction towards him. So what do we do with it? We hear truth, and the truth he spoke is a lie about us, and we feel bad. The Holy Spirit, the alarm goes off, and so we understand the truth is coming. And we need to process it because it's going to set you free from something you've been taking captive in it. But how do we look at it? It's something negative because my alarm went off. I was comfortable and now I don't feel comfortable. Like I probably shared with you. What does the alarm clock sound like to you? Is it that clanging bell or is it sweet music to you? Because you realize we say, I want to know Jesus. He is the Word, He is the truth. So if the Holy Spirit reveals it, why aren't we excited in embracing that? We want to know more about him. We want to be like him. So you bring his truth and you process that in your life. That part of you is like Jesus. That makes you like him in that area. So why are we resisting that? Why do you think Satan fights so hard in all the churches to keep him from actually preaching truth? To even know what it is. Because he doesn't want them to know Jesus. But if somebody comes along and starts preaching the truth, and the people start getting convicted and exposing Satan's work in they get offended. They get out of control, and they go down the road with their billfolds to the next church that will not say anything that makes them uncomfortable. And we wonder why. The leaders we have in church is a result of the people. God gives us exactly what we deserve. It's what we want. One of the signs in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians 4 in the last days is people would not endure sound doctrine. But they would eat themselves, teachers having eats and years, and be turned into fables. We don't want to hear truth. Uh, but I share about the hardest message to minister anywhere is the one on the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And that is the essence of who He is. He is Lord. So, why would you want to know Him as Lord? That's who He is now. That's who He's always been. That's who He's going to be throughout eternity. If we go to heaven, we get our glorified bodies, and we rule the whole new universe, He's going to be Lord. So why would he not want to get used to him and know him that way? Because that's who he is. Mm-hmm. He's not going to save us again when we get to heaven. That work's done in the Savior. But the Lord work isn't done. He's going to still be Lord for eternity. Mm-hmm. So why do we not want to get used to that? We really don't even know him as Savior. Because we don't even understand what he saved us from. Because all we know I want to get saved from is hell. Well, what do you do with the scripture that says, work out your salvation daily? Well, I thought it was just a one thing deal. Yes, being born into the family, yes, that was a one thing deal. But 
put included in that salvation was getting delivered from every snare that the devil has you in and getting you completely free. So you're free to be a servant of the Lord. So that is an ongoing daily basis. So that everything the enemy stole from you is taken back. Or any ignorances that you had when you got saved because somebody didn't give you all the information you should have, that he starts giving you that so that all those snares you was taken into that church you was in or wherever it is at, you get saved from that. You get delivered. So every time you get delivered out of the snare, he just saved you from that lie. He saved you from that trap. So that's a daily thing that should be worked out. We're going to talk about the process of once we're saved, the next thing's going to happen to the Father. He's going to thoroughly purge every child, right? He's going to expose all these tricks of the devil, and he's going to reveal his ways to you, and it will create a process of old things passing away, and all things becoming new. That's daily. So daily we're getting saved from something else that we've been taking captive. We're getting breaking out of one channel after the other, and we're becoming more free all the time. And we're leaving that and we're getting to know who Jesus who is truth. And once we know him by embracing and receiving him into our heart, then we're free indeed. That's where the real freedom comes. And that's when we really get to know him. One of the common tricks that Satan uses of many Christians is judging. Matthew 7 1 says, Judge not lest you be judged. He goes over to the same measure that you meet, is going to meet meant back to you. Why are we not supposed to be judging? Because he's judge. So for me to be judged when he is the judge, I have to usurp authority over him just like the Lordship issue. I usurp authority over him and I become the judge. Jesus didn't even judge me this year in John 5 30. He said, I don't even seek your consult now but with the will of my father he sent me. He didn't judge, but he said, when I judge, it's because of what the Father said. The Father made the judgment through him. It doesn't mean it's a position of authority, something that you don't have to, you're not required to make judgment, but the judgment can't originate from you. It has to originate from the judge. You're in a position of authority that you might make the judgment through, just like parents. You don't make a judgment through you for your children to bring correction. But it shouldn't be originating for you. You should be an object of the Lord about your children. If they need to be corrected, you should be an object of the Lord about the punishment not being. Not you reacting out of your frustration and you just want to get them out of your hair or deal with something, you know. <laughs> So Satan uses that, and the very thing that we don't want to happen to us starts happening to us. We don't show grace and we don't show mercy. Guess what? Then we don't get grace and we don't get mercy when we're judged. And so a lot of people think God is being very harsh with them when they're wrong. I wonder why. Are they being very harsh with everybody that they don't agree with? That does something wrong to them? Because whatever you measure is going to be measured by you. You're deciding. And the correction of the Lord is very gracious to me. Because I'm very gracious to somebody else. I'm not even some judge and fear. I don't have an opinion about it. If I see something in the realm of my responsibility, then I am not the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to do in this situation? And He will give a direction, He will give a judgment of what's to be done, and I will do that in obedience. And I don't just go do what He says to do, I ask Him to do it through me to let me feel exactly the motion and the tone, even you know, when He wants it said, not just me. Yeah, he could be saying something very gentle, and I can repeat exactly what He said in a strong voice to you. And the body language is totally different, gives the scene completely different than what God said. Hearing God for me to stand up and minister somewhere was the easiest part. To allow the ministry in the tone and the emotion he wanted to minister in, that's a different level of difficulty. 
Because if I wasn't communicating that, if I got up there and God wanted to say something strong or rebuke, but I'm watering down to an exhortation and said the same thing, I just misrepresented him. Mm -hmm. That you understand what I'm saying? Or if he was exhorting somebody something, but I needed a rebuke, again, the Spirit doesn't witness them. They heard something that was what he said, but it wasn't him. So it's not truth because the emotion that's with it wasn't appropriate. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So the whole picture of the truth. I don't want my man I was training. He would come to me, we'd have our training sessions, and I would ask him if God didn't do anything for a group. And he would have a word that God had spoken clearly to him, and he would make sure he called about it. There's no question, this is God. Yeah. Yeah. He prayed it through, the Spirit went through, there's no question. But I'd have everybody, would anyone share? I said, everybody would say, without opinion, we're asking the Holy Spirit to bear ways that it's the truth or not. So he would share something, and the Holy Spirit would not witness anybody there. So I had to show them with him. I told Joe, I said, the Holy Spirit is not bearing ways today. And he'd get very defensive. I know God said this. I said exactly word for word what God said. But he did hear from God. So I asked God, I said, God, did you say that to him? And God said, yes. But is this what he would have said to us? No. Because as a minister, maybe God will come share with you. And he may just quickly say you're having a problem somewhere. He may just question to me, this is what your problem is. And I understand all the stuff that goes with that. So if I go there and just repeat what God said to me, if I just overwhelm you. So what he told me in 30 seconds, he had me take 25 minutes to teach tell him to you. Mm -hmm. So he's break it down. It has to be then him saying that again, how he wants to say it to the people I'm speaking to. So when I go to every church, everywhere I go, not only have a different denomination, different beliefs, but I've got people from different levels of maturity, I don't, I don't know them. God knows them. I don't know if they need to be exhorted or reproved or rebuked. That's it. It's his children, not mine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but my responsibility is let him say what he wants to say to his children. That's wherever I go in the world. Sometimes people like me, sometimes they don't like me. That's irrelevant to me. Because when I get back to my room before I go to bed, and I'm the person I pray to, Lord, were you able to say through me what you want to say to your children? And I have been great me. Was I faithful in that? <clears throat> and if I was, then it was successful if everybody knew I got mad at me. But if everybody thought I was a great guy or coming down the road and he wasn't pleased with me, I failed. You understand what I'm saying? So, where's the motivation then? So the judging is important. The John 5 30, if you want to see how Jesus functions, you need to read that. Did anybody here know they would ever have an Amplified Bible? You know what the Amplified Bible is? You ought to read John 5.30 in the Amplified Bible. It's pretty interesting. Now the Amplified is not a translation. It's just taking key words and giving the full Greek definition, Hebrew definition, expounding on particular words. So it slows it down to you going looking up that word. It's real. This is the important word, so it fills in. It's, I wouldn't use that as a study now, but it's nice. Especially John 5.30, if you haven't had to buy, read that in there. And that was normal for Jesus. And Jesus did not even consider or consult his own will, but only the will and the good pleasure of the Father who sent him. We're supposed to be like Jesus, then what's the difference? If anybody was smart enough and pure enough and holy enough that God would trust, the Father would trust, to make their own decision, certainly would have been Jesus. And he did not do it, period. He didn't even seek or consult his own will. Only the will and the good pleasure of my Father who sent him. 
He had no desire whatsoever. He didn't judge. I judge as I'm bidden to decide. I decide as I'm bidden to decide. This is Jesus that, that filled the whole universe. He created everything. Mm -hmm. That everything in the universe is under him. Except the one who put everything under him. So if he has that attitude towards the Father, what should I be our attitude towards him? Mm -hmm. If he's our example, if he is perfect as he was, felt that was necessary, why makes the things it's not necessary for us? Why do we think we're good enough that we don't need to do that? Mm -hmm. We can figure it out when Jesus didn't, and he never sinned. Not one time. And he still did do it. That's something to think about. So why do we judge? One of the main reasons we judge to cover up the flaws in our own self. We judge bad fruit in somebody else that is different from ours. <laughs> It's easy to run find somebody that is doing something bad that I'm not doing bad. Right. Yet they look at you and they say, you're doing something bad, they're not doing bad. And <laughs> Satan just uses back and forth. But it comes all from the same tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's easy to see someone else's speck because of the beam in our own eyes. When we judge, we lose grace and mercy for our own selves, because we are then judged. The thought about the spirit, kind of a strange little statement there. You just think about the Holy Spirit. In, we're in, we are. <laughs> you're in the spirit we already are you're in the spirit to try to do something to be something in the spirit you already are you're in the spirit to try to get righteous all the righteous in him and you are righteous in him all the promises are yes there's not anything you do to earn or deserve anything you are a child of God you are in marriage with Jesus Christ. All the promises are yes. The Holy Spirit systematically go back and everything has been authorized. You, it's there. You already are. Because God looks at the fullness of everything from where you are in the Spirit. And it hits all the mark. But He's already authorized everything. He takes it every mark. So you already are. Mm -hmm. So God sees you in fullness. And you already are what He purposed you to be as long as you meet the one little condition of staying in the Spirit. Because as long as you're in the spirit, you realize you cannot sin. It is impossible to sin if you're in the spirit. For you to sin, you have to get out of the spirit first. And so as soon as you decide to take over the Lordship, that takes you out of the spirit, which puts you in the natural realm where you can now make the choices. And whatever you choose, you make good or bad is sin. That's right. From that point. All sin is being condemned. So, in the natural realm, anything you do is sin, no matter how cool spiritual it is. Anything you need somebody to the Lord, and they get a wonderful benefit from it, when your work is tested in that, it's going to burn up and there'll be no reward for it whatsoever. We know that we can't take things with us when we go. But it doesn't mean we can't send something on the head. The Bible says to lay up treasures in heaven with a thief and for a king. Why would God say that if it wasn't possible? I would say in Hebrews, those who come to God you must first believe he is God, and next that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. In 1 Corinthians 3, it says, every work that you do is going to be tested with fire. That work in the Greek means anything you exert any energy to do, not just spiritual thing. Anything in the natural, anything you spend any energy to do, is going to be tested with fire. 
if it passes God's test, you will receive a reward. It doesn't say what your reward is, but you will receive a reward. But if that work burns up, you will suffer the loss of the reward you should have had. Yet your soul will be saved as by fire. So you realize everything you're doing, you have the potential of it having some eternal value, or you have the potential of losing whatever the eternal value. So if you do anything, and that's a whole teaching in itself, so I don't have time to get into all that, but I'll just assure you. I believe anything that originates out of you, your own worship, that functions the natural, I don't care how much God graces it and does something through you, your part is going to burn up. It has no value to your It brought no glory to God whatsoever. <laughs> it brought glory to you. And that's the only reward you're going to get. It's going to burn up. So if it burned up, then whatever you had the potential for, if it had been done in the Spirit, Whatever well, that reward did not go in your account. And normally we think reward, we're always thinking about monitoring. So how much money is it? It's not exactly like we need gold or something to pay the streets for it in heaven when we get there, okay? So I don't think we're going to need to have coins or a bank account when we get there. So can you imagine in God's advanced kingdom with what he has and he can take something for nothing? What he would call a reward? When somebody that was a small coin was faithful with a little one coin, one talent, and he makes a ruler over a city, and it's faithful with three, you can make a ruler over three cities. We can't comprehend what he can give us that is there. But something's got to determine when we show up there, our lives, how much glory was brought to God through our life. Because everything he did through us, he originates and he did through us, is going to pass that test. And not only is it going to bless the people, but it's going to bless us in this life because that keeps us in the spirit, that makes us a faithful servant. But then there's some reward for it as well. When I got a hold of that when I was young, I first thought, well, for it to have any value in eternity, it had to be something more spiritual. And I had to be mature enough to be able to do the spiritual thing. It's kind of just thinking. But once I got a hold of that, and I realized everything I acknowledge got the simplest thing. Now, I'm going to, once I got the communication going and the witness where I could actually ask him a question, I didn't assume any of these things. If I had a thought like that, I would ask the word if that's the truth or not. And when I realized then that whatever I put my hand to, if he's directing it, then I need to expect him to bless him. Again, it has a condition. I've got to believe he would do what he said he would do. He said he would bless the works of my hand. So I believe that, and he always did. If you didn't believe he's going to do it, as you're paying this over the future, then you didn't do it. You didn't meet the condition. But I did believe it, and so I made sure he was telling me to do it. I don't care how simple it was, but I expected the first of all the Holy Spirit be on me, so if there's no other value than that, the fact that the Holy Spirit was on me and he was speaking and directing me and giving me insight in how to do something, that was fun. It made something, it was just a mundane job, exciting. But not only that, it made it have eternal value. Even it had hardly any temporal value. Mm -hmm. There's some things you just got to do. And we don't take to see any value, they just got to be done. Well, why not do it the Lord and have His presence? Because exactly the same way He directed me in that is the same way He directed me to go to that nation that operated by the military coup and deal with all the hard things I had to deal with. It's exactly the same principle. That's why He authorized me to do it. I acknowledge Him and once He directs me, I don't hear what it is. That's why He authorized me to do it. That's the anointing I shared about the last time. And I expect the Spirit of the Lord to be on me to enable me to do what He authorized me to do, but I gotta believe these things. And so I was able to enjoy His presence, even if there wasn't anything eternal about it. But now I realize it did have eternal value. And it's going to affect something that has to affect who He decides we're going to be in eternity, folks. It's going to be a whole new universe. Right. 
and everybody not going to be ruling and reigning at the same level. It's going to take a whole lot to, to run that universe. So the sub, this is the only school we got is what time we got here. It's qualifying for that. And yet we don't even learn anything about the spiritual realm. We don't go to God's school so that the Holy Spirit can teach us the things to qualify us for who we're going. We're studying the things that you know, that's only good on this earth is going to blow up. We burn up. Mm -hmm. And Satan is robbing us from that. So the Spirit, in the Spirit we are, but out of the Spirit we will never be. So everything you want to be in the spiritual realm, if you're out of the Spirit, it will never be. If you're in the Spirit, you don't have to try to be, it already is. It's just that simple. So in the flesh, it's impossible to please God. In the Spirit, it's impossible not to please Him. Everything you do will please God. Amen. Amen. I'll run a few, a few more here in a little bit of time I got left. I get a job until 8 30. By that time, the seats will wear out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We usually so I won't expound on this too much. I just want to uh, run through just a few of his tactics and years that's keeping you from growing up and being a function in the spiritual realm. And just burn it down. The worst thing that Satan can still promise is time. Mm -hmm. Because every moment you're in the flesh is the moment you're not in the spirit. If you're in the spirit, you'd be growing and things would be happening in the spirit, you'd be preparing for eternity. So if 98% of the time you're in the flesh, then 98% of the time you're not in the spirit, which means nothing is happening in the eternal realm that has any value. You're not doing anything that's going in your account. Nothing is qualifying you for what you want to be in eternity. It's just still. So that is the worst thing you can steal is your time. So the next thing I want to share with you is that one of his tricks is procrastination. You have your problem with that putting something off, things that you know that need to be dealt with, especially the spiritual things, but you put them off. The pastor was talking about it. He was studying the book, he got to the point, first thing you know, then you're all doing other things, and it seems right. But you're procrastinating on the one thing you know God said to do. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you're procrastinating on that. I'm not, I'm not thinking on him now. I'm just saying that's just normal. Okay? But this is a tactic to say. So when we catch ourselves doing that, it should be your red light go off and an alarm going off, realize, uh oh, these thoughts of do this, do that, and all these things, that's coming from Satan. That's him coming with a way that seems right, and I never brought that thought in control and tested and asked it was, it was the Lord. Now, if you say, Tom, I start reading other books of that, and I'm not picking on that, I'm just saying, okay, did, did you ask the Lord if you start read that other book? Or do it? The books don't do it. It's an oh, that how it sounds good, I'll do this. Mm -hmm. And then you're all going another way that seems right. It's just that easy, you were procrastinating from the very thing that what we're supposed to be doing. Satan perverts priorities. Even though you say something important, but all of a sudden then he starts giving you other things that are more important. Even though it should be the number one priority, he's dropping down to number 22 or something. Throwing down the list. So he doesn't get the four hours it needed, he got 10 minutes. So it never got finished. So Satan stole that, but he never gave it the time or priority it should have had. So we got to concentrate on that. The Lord prioritized the things in our life. That's why we're supposed to nod them all our way. And He would choose what needs to be done now. And that's finished. Now move to this, move to this. There's a time and season for everything. So He gives you how long you're supposed to be in this book. How long you should be doing this and that. If you're doing that, then you're in the spirit the whole time. So everything is working to your good. So even if he's only on this subject 10 minutes, and that's when He said, that's enough. Then you get the full reward because that's all you're supposed to be. You stayed there an hour and ten minutes, and then an hour you was there, you weren't supposed to be there. You're supposed to be somewhere else doing something else. <laughs> so you work in the spirit, you was there an hour in the flesh trying to do more spiritual things. It switches so easy. 
Satan is good at perverting the cause and the benefits of trusting and obeying God. When it comes to trying to trust and obey God, Satan brings all kinds of thoughts of what this is going to cost me. I gotta give this up, I gotta give this up, I gotta give this up, I gotta give this up. At the same time, then, the benefits of actually trusting God, he diminishes to where we don't see any really value of it. You know, we put more value on what we want in the temple realm than what God's trying to get us in the term realm. So Satan perverts it both ways, the cost and the benefit. It's another one of the things he has to do with focusing on how far you are ahead of others instead of how far you are behind what God requires of you. <laughs> so those are more serious and a little more material because you're starting to get into places you're a real danger to him. So he started giving you that 20 20 hindsight when you're now looking and judging. Everybody has to realize how far you are ahead of them. So why not need to be heard because they're not even doing what I already know. It's a pastor. Well, I need to be studying anymore. They're not even walking on what I heard of been teaching them. So your tendency is to slow down and make something else have, have priority. Rather than realize Jesus is the example. And we come to the fullness of the measure of Him. So we're not there. Which means I still need a spirit that I used to be pressing on towards that mark. So these are the things that Satan used. Uh, <clears throat> it gives us excuses for why you're not spiritual consistently. So we all know we're not, they're not, a lot of people know they're not spiritually consistent. So are you humbling yourself and repenting of that, or are you making some kind of excuse? Typical excuses is, well, the reason I'm not spiritual consistently, I'm just not mature enough. When I share with the being spiritual, it has nothing to do with maturity. Living in the kingdom was a gift that came by grace and faith, not a work. So that's a lie. Mm -hmm. I'm not worthy enough. You feel like I'm not worthy. Well, that's true, you're not. But that has nothing to do with being spiritual. That's right. It's by grace and faith. It means if you have to be worthy, you wouldn't need grace. So that's a lie. I'm not called as a minister. And we believe in I that only ministers can really be spiritual that's authorized to be in that spiritual realm. Or I'm not important enough. My calling is I'm just ministering some helps or something. I'm not the pastor of an unimportant. So you're simply going to get this. Only these people can be spiritual. Uh, Satan creates doubt to hinder our faith. I can do a whole teaching on that. That's all they got to do is bring a little bit of doubt about the truth. So that when you try to believe, or even in general, you believe that's the truth, your faith won't release. Because that doubt causes you to say, yeah, I'll buy it. <coughs> and it won't release. It doesn't have to be much, it's something to block it. And we haven't been taught how to increase that doubt and get rid of it, purify our faith, and be able to release it. So that purifying your faith is much more precious than go and very few people are working on that consistently. So my faith is clear that I can believe whatever God says to me. If it's not, that's a red flag and I'm going to get my full my t-shirt until I find out the reasons why it's not flowing in this area until it will flow. Because I want to be able to see God say something, it's already yes for we even say it. And that's my basic attitude. That's they sound a little strange. Before I acknowledge God in my ways, my answer is already yes before I even know what he's going to tell me. That's my attitude. I don't care what he's going to tell me. I'm going to trust it and I'm going to do it. That don't mean I may be able to do it then, but I'm going to accept that that's what I am going to do. And if I can't do it, then just reach it and I'll seek him and you'll show me the reason that there are no reason and I will do it. So therefore it's not an issue. I am going to do it. Just <laughs> prove that I do it now or next week or next month. But I will do it. That's an attitude. Yeah. Try to understand it, uh, with your mind what being spiritual is like. And that's what folks messed up because the natural being understands the spiritual. So if you sit there trying to understand what the spiritual is like, God's not going to show you. So guess who's going to show you? 
yeah. Satan is an angel of light, and it's not going to be true. So you get involved, and you use that, then judge everybody else for their spiritual or not. <clears throat> Try to understand with your mind what God is like. You can't understand what God is like. The only way you know what God is like is spend time with God. And God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Just a tactic. When you become offended at God with what you thought he was going to do or not do. If you thought he was going to do something, he didn't do it, then you got offended. Though he wasn't going to do something, but he didn't in any way, so you got offended at that. <laughs> we get offended to God for allowing bad things to happen. Every time something bad in the world happens that Satan was the author behind, we blame God for it. Everybody wants their free will, but we don't want to reach the cross of our free will. We get mad at God, why did you let me use my free will? And if God tried to override your free will, we'd be up in arms. <laughs> You gave me a free will, you know. Either way, you're going to lose on that. You get offended that God for allowing bad things to happen. We're not using the scripture properly, like in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration. God is profitable for correction, for instruction, and righteousness. By so we can be thoroughly furnished. Mm -hmm. So we look at that. We ignore that. Uh, that just scratches the surface of some of his titles. If I bring my thoughts in control of Christ and acknowledge the guy all the way, none of his titles work. Even if they sounded good, it gets stopped before I release my faith in it. Or before I obey it. 